This is a remake of Part 18 and in some ways the most important part of our respectful rebuttal of Richard Gage's 9-11 video, Blueprint for Truth. Even with my 231 reasons favoring natural collapse so far, you may be unconvinced and still asking, what about Building 7? So let's finally investigate one of Richard's central claims that the freefall collapse of part of the north face of Building 7 is the silver bullet which proves controlled demolition beyond a reasonable doubt. At the very beginning of the debate, Richard Gage said, quote, My opponent must resolve the symmetrical freefall collapse of Building 7, or the debate is over. Let's go over it in more detail, because it is of critical importance to the controlled demolition theory. Common sense tells me that a building can't collapse at gravitational acceleration, as NIST said, unless all resistance has been removed from below the collapsing structure. How could any part of that collapse of Building 7 be at freefall? Three buildings collapsed on 9-11. Each of the Twin Towers was 110 stories high. They never exceeded about two-thirds of freefall acceleration. Building 7 was 47 stories high, and only one perimeter wall of eight of those stories is known to have collapsed at freefall acceleration. So out of a total of 267 floors collapsing and one face of eight of those floors coming down at freefall, engineers I've talked to have said this is insignificant. But I kept focusing on it because I really wanted to answer this question for both myself and for you. Here is NIST velocity versus time graph of the collapse of the north face roof line of Building 7 as determined by a video of the north perimeter wall. The actual measured velocities are represented by the dots on the graph, with velocity shown on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. These measured velocities are not measurements of the actual collapse speeds of the three other walls, NIST added a straight line ascending to show the alignment of the dots with pure freefall acceleration and a curved line to show the velocity pattern implied by the dots. Draw lines between any two dots and you will see that in stage one, the velocity slope shown by the thick green line on the left is less than NIST's red line freefall slope. So in stage one of Building 7's collapse, you can see that the building is descending at less than freefall acceleration. Stage 2 is almost a perfect match for freefall collapse of the north perimeter wall. There is slight variation, around one-tenth of one percent, which is within the margin of error of NIST measurements. So you see two of the slopes, also emphasized with thick green lines, have a very slightly steeper slope than freefall. NIST said the collapse was at gravitational acceleration. Now, freefall acceleration does not mean no resistance. It means no net resistance, meaning resistance can be canceled out by other forces. For one wall of eight floors of Building 7, we may have had negative net resistance with very slightly faster than freefall acceleration. Freefall does not mean controlled demolition either. The Southwark Towers demolition, for example, took 7.4 seconds, not the 4.5 seconds of freefall. That's because in controlled demolition, they often don't use enough explosives to eliminate all resistance. You might just have a near freefall acceleration at the beginning of a controlled demolition and then less than freefall acceleration as they rely more on gravity to do the rest of the work. Building 7 started at much less than freefall, then briefly equaled freefall for eight stories on one wall, then quickly went to less than freefall by the end. This would have required less than usual amount of explosives to start the collapse, then way more explosives to bring it up to freefall in the middle, then fewer or no explosives again near the end. As a controlled demolition advocate explained to me, quote, Building 7 was overkill. By contrast, NIST's freefall model, quote, showed the exterior columns buckling and losing their capacity to support the loads from the structure above, close quote. So here's how the freefall collapse of party building seven could have happened naturally. Imagine that there's a stick, and that stick is one of the columns. If you push down on the stick, there's going to be a little bit of resistance at first, but then finally, when the stick breaks, then, of course, at that point, the stick loses all of its strength, or almost all of its strength. The columns were interconnected so that the load was shared. Columns buckle, but in both cases, there is a sudden release and loss of strength. After a complex internal collapse sequence as proposed by NIST with minor variations as suggested by other experts, the slow stage one of the collapse of the perimeter walls begins. NIST states that, quote, the entire building above the buckled column region then moved downward in a single unit, as observed. They made precise measurements on the speed of that collapse using a single videotape looking straight at the north perimeter wall. In stage one, 
The final perimeter collapse started almost imperceptibly, like the stick barely bending, much slower than freefall. Classic controlled demolition started closer to freefall acceleration, so gravity can do its work more quickly. But in stage one, acceleration increased gradually as net resistance gradually fell away, until in stage two it per attained perhaps very slightly faster than freefall on one wall for only eight stories out of 47. Acceleration bumps around a bit for those eight stories. In the final sections of the collapse, it slowed down. If this were a controlled demolition, why would the acceleration rate have been so slow at first? There was a tremendous amount of smoke coming from the building just before the collapse, as you can see here. Then the east penthouse collapses, and you can see sunlight shining through the upper left windows and more windows breaking along the left side as the penthouse collapsed to the ground inside. This was an asymmetrical interior collapse followed by an external collapse into the building's weakest points, not a symmetrical controlled demolition. For seven or eight seconds, the interior caved in on itself, much as described by NIST with some variations as offered by others. Remember, the initial internal collapse sequence was mostly invisible to us, which is why there is room for competing hypotheses. You can see in this picture how very asymmetrical the collapse of Building 7 really was, taken from a different angle. Now here's a simulation I drew to help explain the north perimeter collapse, and from here I will speak slowly. After stage one begins, at number two near the top, you can see the east penthouse collapse. Number three near the right center is debris falling inside the center of the building and down, shifting the load to the perimeter columns over those eight seconds. Number four at the bottom, the debris piles spread out at the bottom and pushed out against columns randomly, stressing the columns with irregular horizontal loads. Go back up to number five at the top. The columns, unevenly weakened from seven hours of fires, were also pulled in from the breaking support beams above. The small kink along the top of the building was evidence of columns about to buckle, mostly at the weaker, welded connections. Now go about two-thirds down to number six. The perimeter columns buckled, pushing their loads to other columns at the speed of sound, triggering more column breaks at the weaker welded connections causing gradually increasing acceleration as structural resistance in the perimeter columns quickly gave way one by one. This begins stage two of the perimeter collapse, where acceleration may have slightly exceeded 100% of freefall for some of those eight stories. Let's talk about how. In number seven, an eight-story chunk of floors held onto a perimeter wall. Those attached floors may have literally torqued the perimeter wall down those eight stories. A 9-11 Truth researcher told me this would have no effect on the net collapse speed. Quote, think of the falling chunk of building as a system. Put a dotted line around it as the boundary of the system. Anything going on within the system, such as any torquing, will have no effect on the motion of the system as a whole. Well, the entire collapsing building is not the system we are measuring. We are measuring only the collapse speed of the north perimeter wall. So if we draw our dotted line around the upper north perimeter wall and think of that as our system, then the internal torquing and leveraging happening to the visible wall is outside of that system and can be affecting the speed of the wall's collapse. The falling building core pulled the perimeter down via the floor trusses, so we are treating the facade only as the system which fell at 1G or slightly faster. The torquing or leveraging would thus be external to the system. Now here's the most important part. Those collapsing beams still clinging to the wall functioned as levers. If the left end of the beam is momentarily held in place or even slowed down in its fall, the left side becomes the pivot for the lever. If the right side is still grabbing onto the wall and some kind of weight is also yanking the beam down, that weight is leveraged and the lever overcomes residual resistance from the buckling columns and throws the facade down at freefall or maybe faster than freefall acceleration. Look at number nine. This leveraged pull down overwhelmed any remaining resistance from the buckled columns and resulted in net zero or less than net zero resistance and perhaps a barely faster than free fall drop. And finally, number 10, as the perimeter crashed into the debris pile, its descent was slowed. This is the third slower stage of the collapse sequence. 
So to summarize, there were three forces at work on Building 7 during its collapse, and the sum of these three forces varied with time. The constant downward force of gravity, the highly variable upward force of weak buckling columns, and other highly variable downward forces due to connections to other parts of the building. The connective forces between parts of the building may have briefly accelerated parts of it at greater than 1 g, more than overcoming any slight structural resistance from the already buckled columns. As one physicist told me when I presented this hypothesis, quote, this is a highly plausible and rational conclusion to be drawn from the totality of the data. Controlled demolition cannot explain possible greater than free fall acceleration, and buildings being brought down by controlled demolition usually collapse at slower than free fall after the first few seconds anyway. And how can hot, non-explosive thermate in Building 7 explain a possible faster than free fall drop? Thermate cuts through steel like a hot knife through butter, but much too slowly for precise demolition, as you can see for yourself on YouTube. And if thermates were used on the outer columns, there would be hundreds of blinding lights through the windows with no dust to block the view. Even if the light was shielded at first, thermate would continue to burn bright for at least 30 seconds more, well past and through the entire collapse sequence, when masking the light sources would be impossible. And the perimeter wall wouldn't have maintained its integrity, as this picture proves it did. Nor would it have folded over the whole top of the building, as this photo shows. You can see that after the building collapsed into the weakened south face, the north perimeter blanketed much of the debris and was not burned apart by thermates. The purpose of my debate with Richard Gage was one, to model respectful disagreement, and two, to use my journalistic training to offer a narrative summary for lay people of the scientific reasons supporting the natural collapse of the World Trade Center buildings on 9-11. I've now explained all of the major anomalies Richard demanded I account for. I have also given over 200 reasons why the controlled demolition theory is contradicted by the facts. Richard Gage has failed to meet his burden of proof which is on anyone who makes such an extraordinary claim. Instead, he digs up anomalies and demands I prove they're not caused by controlled demolition. I fought this debate the hard way by clearly answering them, and now you, the viewer, have some good information. I respectfully submit that the weight of the evidence overwhelmingly favors natural collapse. Richard, the debate is over. This, as I said, is a remake of Part 18. I am grateful to some 9-11 truth researchers who have corrected some mistakes in this video. The most obvious one was that I accidentally talked about free fall in stage one of this collapse. This was a simple glitch of a tired brain. I have always known that Building 7's collapse began at less than free fall. Someone also caught a misunderstanding of mine when I said that dots above the straight line drawn by NIST show faster than free fall. I now understand it's the steepness of a line drawn between two dots that shows free fall or maybe faster. I am not grateful for the assertion that these mistakes reveal a profound ignorance of the basics of physics, and therefore, quote, nothing else I say can be taken seriously. This is just a way of telling you to ignore everything I say, all 235 reasons I laid out. If a journalist uncovers embezzlement by a small town mayor, that mayor might retort that the reporter confused the contingency fund with the general fund. So how could anyone believe a word he said? Journalists uncover information outside their areas of expertise all the time and hope readers and experts use the information to investigate further and perhaps act. As a journalist, I exposed 235 reasons not to believe in controlled demolition. I had some inaccuracies in the use of the scientific language, and I am correcting them here. I would never consider undertaking a scientific debate. I did ace physics and chemistry in school, and even dabbled in rocket science by figuring out the formula for acceleration of acceleration when spaceships hurtle towards the Earth and the gravitational pull gradually increases. I invite you to resist the urge to ignore everything I've said because of mistakes, which some say reveal my profound ignorance. That's just not true. I understand this material fairly well, and I trust you to judge my arguments on their merits. Ultimately, it is up to you to decide. And thank you for watching.